I'm Sam Vaknin, and I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, bringing you the latest from the COVID-19 pandemic. Anthony Fauci is a famous medical celebrity in the United States. He is the Tsar of the medical response of the United States to the COVID-19 pandemic. Anthony Fauci has published a series of academic papers in which he had calculated the case fatality rate, the virulence, the, the death rate associated with SARS-CoV-2, with the virus, he calculated this rate to be 0.1%. And then a day later, two days later, after publishing these articles, he appeared on the media, on the popular media. And there he said that the case fatality rate, the death rate associated with the virus, is 1%. So among his colleagues in academic papers, he uses the number 0.1% when he appears in the popular media, such as, for example, on Comedy Central on March 27th. He uses a number that he knows very well is wrong and exaggerated by a factor of 10. For you to understand, an art he published an article in the New England Medical Journal on March 26, where he had calculated the death rate to be 0.1%. And then on March 27th, he appeared on Comedy Central and he said the death rate is 1%, knowing full well that he is providing inaccurate information, not to use worse terms. Why is Anthony Fauci, Fauci misleading the public? Why has he been doing it repeatedly for months now? This gives rise, of course, to conspiracy theories. The government is planning military rule all over the United States. Donald Trump is planning to postpone or cancel the elections. There are numerous conspiracy theories floating around. I think the truth is much simpler. The virus is an unknown entity, unknown quantity. No one knows what it is capable or not capable of doing. There's a dearth of data. We'll come to it in a minute. So, both medical professionals and politicians panic, simply panic. They want people to stay indoors because they don't know any better. They are not sure of what they are doing. And so they want to scare people. They, cre they are creating panic on purpose. The panic that has swept across the globe is designed, is intentional. And its aim is to keep you indoors. They are afraid that if they give you the real numbers, you will simply say, well, the hell with it. It's not much worse than the flu. And you'll go out in your millions. And then when you go out in your millions, something may happen. They don't know what. No one does. If you want the straight dope, if you want the truth on COVID-19, you should watch unbiased medical authorities, not conspiracy theorists, not government employees, but third-party academic unbiased authorities. Two or three weeks ago, in my first video on COVID-19, I suggested that based on a mathematical model that, that I had used, and that is in, in wide use, I didn't invent it, the case fatality rate should be around 0.7%. Today, I had been proven wrong. The case fatality rate is actually one-tenth of this. Here is the unvarnished truth. COVID-19 is not much worse than a bad flu. Nothing more, nothing less. And you don't have to trust me on this. Watch any video on COVID-19 by Professor John Ioannidis, I-O-A-N-N-I-D-E-S, <clears throat> John Ioannidis of Stanford University, the quintessential medical doctor, avuncular, calm, reasoned, well-informed, not jumping to conclusion, not panicking, not lying. Read anything written by Professor J. Bhattacharya from Stanford University as well. Bhattacharya, B-H-A-T-T-A-C-H-A-R-Y-A, -T -T -A -A -A, not his fault, this family name. 
Jay Patachalia and his team have just finished calculating and publishing um, the case fatality rate, the mortality rate, and other critical epidemiological numerical factors. And they discovered that it's true. COVID-19 is not much worse than a bad flu. And we have had such pandemics of bad flu in 2008, 2009, and two years ago. So detox yourself. Watch these people. Read these people. And also watch Professor Suchavit Bhakdi, B-H-A-K-D-I, of Mainz University in Germany. He's a bit grandiose. A bit, there's a lot of affectation there. He's a drama queen. But he knows what he's talking about. Watch these people. Do not trust the government. Don't trust even me. Just watch these people. Now let's talk about a few of the outstanding issues. In my previous videos on COVID-19, I gave you the bleeding edge uh, data, information and research on the virus and the disease. Today I'm going to um, deal with a few additional issues. There's a question about vaccines or vaccination. One of the main uh, claims of governments all over the world, we want to keep you home to give us time to develop a vaccine so that when you exit your homes finally, we'll be able to vaccinate you. And even if you do catch COVID-19, it'll be a mild variant. You will survive because you will have, you will have had antibodies. Vaccination is the keyword and the slogan on everyone's lips. Never mind that a proper vaccine won't be, won't be ready uh, in fewer than 18 months. So it'll take a year and a half, two years before a first operable vaccine is available. Never mind that all vaccines that we have tried with coronaviruses backfired badly and created even worse diseases. So we have tried, for example, a coronavirus vaccine with cats. And the cats, when they did catch the coronavirus disease, became much more ill than the cats which were not vaccinated. Vaccines in coronaviruses tend to enhance the disease, make it worse, not make it better, for reasons we don't fully understand. That's the historical experience. But let's assume we do succeed to develop a vaccine. Let's assume it works well and doesn't have the same effects in humans that it has in cats. What is vaccination? Vaccination is advertently purposefully causing an artificial controlled pandemic in order to generate herd immunity. We cause mild disease in people, in many people, in hundreds of millions of people, so that so many people are immune, so many people create antibodies that they cannot get infected in the future. Once a sufficient number of people are immune, the virus finds it difficult to propagate. And even those who are not immune they are called free riders. Even those who are not immune are safe. So there's a virus. It tries, it tries to infect people. Most people are immune. The virus fails. Even those who are not immune are saved. As long as the vaccine is successful, the virus is uh, under selective pressure. So let me try to explain this, this concept. Right now, the virus is successful. It succeeds to infect people because the population is naive. In other words, the population, all of us, have never been exposed to this particular variant of SARS, SARS covariant 2. And because we haven't been exposed to this particular variant, this particular virus, the virus makes headway. headway. The virus succeeds to infect us. As long as it succeeds to infect us, the virus has no reason to mutate, has no reason to change. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. So the virus just passes uh, happy-go-lucky from one person to another, literally unchangeable. The virus this particular virus mutates twice a month, which is nothing in terms of influenza family viruses. Other influenza, viruses family, um, influenza family viruses mutate four to six times in, um, a month, and very often they mutate twice or three times a week. So this virus is not mutating right now. There are only eight distinguishable strains, distinct strains of this virus, which is nothing, five months after the outbreak. And it's not mutating 
because it is successful. It is not under selective pressure. Selective pressure is a pressure exerted by failure. When the virus fails to propagate, because, for example, many people are immune, this creates natural selection. The weaker variants of the virus die out because they don't succeed to infect people. The stronger variants, the more equipped variants, the variants who have undergone mutation, they succeed to infect people because people still don't have antibodies to these mutated versions. And this is called selective pressure. Selective pressure is the engine of ev evolution. When we are faced with an adverse environment or when we are faced with an environment that has changed, some of us die out. And those of us who are adapted to this new environment survive, they have children, and these children also have these qualities, adapted, adapted to the new environment. And this is the same with viruses, same with bacteria. They evolve, they mutate, they change in response to selective pressure, in response to changes in the environment. Now, here's the problem. If the vaccine is successful, many people will be immune. And if many people are immune, this will put selective pressure on the virus to mutate, to evolve, to adapt. So the best strategy is to rapidly obtain herd immunity. If we obtain herd immunity gradually, if we expose only slices and slivers of the population, incrementally, bit by bit, we are forcing the virus to alter, to change, to mutate, to adapt, to improve its arsenal in order to get as many people as it can before it is too late for the virus to replicate. If we do what we are doing right now, quarantine, universal quarantine, social isolation, social distancing, this is forcing the virus, forcing the virus to mutate and adapt, to recombine with other viruses using antigenic shift, we are, with our misguided medical and social policies, forcing the virus to become what it is not right now. Right now, it's a bad flu. If we continue with our policies, if we deny the virus bodies to infect, if we don't give the virus access to hosts, the virus will become really vicious just in order to survive. Now, of course, we don't need to make human sacrifices. We don't need to give old people, we don't need to give the virus access to old people, to immunocompromised people, to pregnant women, to weak people. These populations should be isolated, should be quarantined, should not be in touch with anyone. These populations should be shielded and fiercely protected from the virus. But all the others should be exposed to the virus so that the virus can propagate and replicate, use human cells to replicate itself and feel happy and not have bad blood with humans for having denied it the possibility to exist. It's a war and we need to declare a truce with the virus. We need to let the virus survive because if we do not, it will not let us survive. Let it be clear. Presumably, a warmer or more humid weather should have a restraining effect on the pandemic. Spring and summer present a unique opportunity, a window of opportunity, to allow the populations which are less vulnerable to get infected. We need to create herd immunity now. It may be already too late. I'm seeing signs that the virus has undergone antigenic shift. The virus is now killing babies. There's been yet another case. The virus is killing teen teenagers in the United Kingdom. Literally every day, there's a teenager or two who is dying. Newborn babies. The first baby was nine months old. There's a newborn baby that's been killed. These are seriously frightening signs. It may indicate that the virus cannot find hosts because we are all alone in our apartments. And so the virus says, the hell with it. I'm going to change myself. I'm going to change myself so that I'm going to infect whoever. I'm going to infect children. I'm going to infect babies. I'm going to infect strong people. I'm going to infect people with strong immune systems. The virus, probably the first thing the virus will do, it will cloak itself. It will steal or combine 
uh, genetic material from another virus so as to deceive the immune system. So our Im immunological system, our immune system, won't be able to see the virus at all and will not be reacting. I'm seeing signs of this as well. I'm seeing people who have had one bout, one attack of COVID-19, then they feel well for six, five, six days, and then they have another round. This is a sign that the immune system fails to detect the virus for a few days. Because our symptoms, fever, fatigue, the cough itself, these are this, this is, these are the reactions of the immune system to the virus. If the immune system can't see the virus, we won't have fever. We will not feel tired. We will not cough. We will not have diarrhea. If the immune system fails to see the virus, we will feel totally healthy. And I'm beginning to see signs that this is happening. Now, there are dozens of countries which implemented quarantine and social distancing measures only very recently. These are the countries, actually, with moderate to high infection rates per million population, but by far the lowest death rates, lowest case fatality rates. I'm going to repeat this because it's counterintuitive and it's against all the panic propaganda that is thrown at you via the media by governments. The countries which have implemented quarantine and social distancing late in the game are the countries where the fewest people are dying. Yes, in some of them, the infection rates are very high, but the fewest people are dying. These countries include China. China ignored the pandemic for two months. Israel, Russia, Sweden, North Macedonia, the United States, Brazil, most of Africa, most of Latin America, Mexico, Asia, and refugee camps everywhere. In all these places, there was no quarantine, no social distancing, nothing. And lo and behold, even though the number of infections is enormous, the number of deaths is minimal and less than minimal. And that includes countries like Germany and, as I mentioned, Israel. Luckily for humanity, quarantines and social distancing are luxuries that only the self-indulgent and navel-gazing West can afford. The rest of the world can't implement it simply. People live in close quarters, the numerous homeless people, the refugee camps, 70 million people are internally displaced and refugees. People live in villages. I mean, there's no way to implement these measures, luckily for humanity. Coronavirus conferred immunity typically lasts from a few months to a few years. This is true for other coronaviruses. Coronavirus is a family of viruses with hundreds of viruses. And we know quite a lot about this family. So there was no need for such enormous panic. So we know that coronaviruses, especially the egregious kinds like SARS and MERS, they, they make you immune and then your immunity lasts for years sometimes. And so if this is true, reinfection is unlikely. It's possible if your immune system has glitches, doesn't function properly, but it's very unlikely. Viral clearance is universal. There is no, there are no measurable viral load or shedding two weeks after full recovery. In other words, two weeks after someone recovers, he is not infectious or she is not infectious anymore at all. And we define recovery as two negative swabs, two negative tests. So two weeks after you have had two negative tests for COVID-19, even if you had gone through the disease, even if you've experienced the disease, you've had all the symptoms, even if you had very bad disease, two weeks later, you're totally clean and you will not infect anyone. Obviously, we need fast serological tests and they are coming on, on stream. We need blood tests and they're coming on stream and they should guarantee that recovering patients and asymptomatic folks are safe to interact with and be around. And, but here's another, here's another panicky message. And wh what amazes me is that the medical professionals who propagate these messages very much as the virus propagates, um, know that what they're saying is not true. I don't want to use a stronger word. 
but they know that what they're saying is not true. They are creating panic on purpose. I have never come across a case in human history where medical professionals set a task of creating population-wide panic. This is the first case in human history. It's unprecedented. For example, one needs to be in very close physical proximity with a heavily infected symptomatic patient, aerosolizing patient, a patient who is coughing, who is sneezing. And one needs to be with such a patient in close proximity for at least 30 minutes. I repeat, for at least 30 minutes to get infected. No one is telling you this. You're getting the impression from doctors, government employed doctors, that if you just pass next to someone, you'll get infected. Nothing is further from the truth. As the pandemic proceeds apace, at least in the hysterical media, hospitals are becoming major vectors of transmission. We are beginning to have iatrogenic cases, cases that people contracted in hospitals. Some estimates are that 40% of all COVID cases are actually, have been actually contracted in hospitals. That's extremely bad news and unnecessary news. An analysis of the intake of hospitals in Italy, for example, shows that well over 70 or 80% of the people who have been taken to the, into the hospital should not have been, should not have been. Hospitals took in COVID-19 cases, which were mild, but still highly infectious. And so they ended up infecting other patients and hospitals have become hubs of infection. And shockingly, not a single randomized double-blind trial with a control group had been conducted on any population anywhere in the world. This is, this defies belief. The first thing we do in epidemiology, we take 10,000 random, a group of, a random group of 10,000 people and we test them to see if they have COVID-19, if they have uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2, if they have the virus or not. That's the first thing. Every country should have selected 10,000 people randomly by lottery and tested them for the presence of a SARS-CoV-2. This is called a randomized double-blind trial with a control group. No one has done this anywhere in the world and it's the fifth month of the pandemic. This has never happened before in human history. I don't know what's happening with this pandemic. It's all, there is a delinquency of the medical profession that cannot be described and borders on the criminal. It is a reflexive first step in any pandemic, these randomized trials. When the authorities wish to reduce panic and when we need to have reliable epidemiological data, when we don't want to fan and leverage the panic for tyrannical power grabs like in Hungary or Serbia or Russia or frankly the United States or the United Kingdom. When the aim is to heal and cure and contain, not to abuse and leverage the pandemic for political ends. Randomized trials are not the last step. They are absolutely the first step. How else would we know? whether, for example, the majority of the population has the virus. Most, most viruses infect up to upward of 90% of the population. 90% of the population of Earth have herpes. Herpes viruses, herpes 1 and herpes 2, infect well over 90% of the population of Earth. Same goes for the human papilloma virus. So why not COVID? I mean, why not uh, sars cov variant 2 Maybe the whole population is infected already, which changes completely, completely the calculus and what we should and shouldn't do. Then social distancing, for example, is useless. And yet no one conducted these tests. I can't tell you, as someone who has studied medicine, I can't tell you how shocking this is. And doubts are also rising regarding the cause of death in many cases, especially with the elderly, the immunocompromised, and those with pre-existing conditions. Was the virus just present in their bodies when they had died? Or did the virus cause the death? No one knows. Someone dies, they test the body to see if there's COVID, if there's a, if the virus is present. Yes, it's present. They chalk it off. They say, well, he died of the virus. That's not always true. Someone could die, for example, from a heart attack and their body is full of the virus. 
And yet it was not the virus who killed her. There is no such distinction made. In Italy, the majority of patients who died, who had died, were over the age of 81. 81. How likely is it that most of them actually didn't died of other natural causes? Very likely. Very likely. It's extremely likely that a majority of the patients who had died in Italy ostensibly from COVID-19 actually died of other natural causes and reasons. And that includes typical pneu uh, pneumonias. All people die of pneumonia. It is the fourth, the fourth natural cause of death among all people. Respiratory distress for a myriad other reasons. Coronavirus could be a catalyst of other disorders and diseases. How dare we put all the pay all dead patients, all casualties and fatalities into the same group? This is very misleading. And we are destroying our civilization, our economies, and our the very fabric of our society in a panic reaction, the likes of which the world has never seen, fanned deliberately by the political elites in cahoots with unscrupulous celebrity-seeking medical professionals. This is, if this is not malignant pathological narcissism, I don't know what is. Finally, how many of these symptoms are psychogenic? How many of the symptoms are psychosomatic? How many of the symptoms constitute somatization? In other words, how many of these symptoms are because of the panic? Shortness of breath, for example, chest pains. They are classic symptoms of anxiety disorders. And, and respiratory distress in, uh, in uh, patients is typical in panic attacks. Maybe many of these cases have nothing to do with the virus. They have actually much more to do with Anthony Fauci and his in, inane, inaccurate and fallacious proclamations. Maybe it is the panic that's creating shortness of breath, chest pains, respiratory distress. All patients with zoonotic coronaviruses react, I mean, patients who are ill, elderly, pre-existing conditions, they react with respiratory distress. Respiratory distress is nothing new. Coronaviruses are nothing new. The flu is nothing new. None of it is new. The only thing is this specific virus. We lack a lot of information. But we don't lack information so much about the virus as about the populations that it affects. And yet, all the efforts go towards studying the virus and there's zero effort directed at the populations that it allegedly affects. And we're implementing measures that are bordering on dictatorships. We are destroying democracy. We are ruining the financial system, our economies, everything. I, for the first time in my life, sympathize with, with conspiracy theories. I have written extensively against conspiracy theories. I've mocked conspiracy theories. But I must admit, had I been a weaker, less logical, more paranoid person, I would have ended up a conspiracy theorist after this pandemic or within this pandemic. Something is seriously awry. Something is seriously wrong with the reaction of the political elites and the medical establishment and the mainstream media. Something very bad is happening, very evil.